Welcome everyone to the weekly free class of uh, Basics of Digital Painting with me, Pete Morbacher, and you, uh, the people who did the assignment this week. I'm going to go and crit a bunch of your work. I feel kind of bad. There is always way more work in the homework channel than I'm able to critique during any given session. I've got a bunch of them laid out here that I thought were um, something I had, uh, you know, a piece that I had something to say about, um, whether it was a critique or praise or something that I thought was interesting to start a discussion. Ah, screen share. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, and then if anybody has any questions, uh, whenever your stuff comes up, feel free to raise your hand. I can pull you on stage. We can chit chat for a second while we go over your work. And then if you, um, uh, have any additional questions or we still have time and there's still room for feedback, you can ask at the end. And then at the very end of the session, I'm going to give out a homework assignment for next week. Sound good? So first up, we've got Miguel Firewolf. You here? And you, there is no obligation to come up on stage, by the way, but if you want to chit-chat for a second, look over your work, you're always welcome. I don't think Miguel Firewolf's here. Um, used to seeing him. I, all right, so uh, I hope you catch this on the VOD. Uh, very cool work this week. Um, so the challenge this week was to use the uh, round brush, my favorite brush. Um, I think I have it in the brush pack on huckleberry.art as the old huckleberry brush. This is what it looks like. It is a size flow brush. Um, so it's a regular round brush with the size flow on, no opacity flow. And then the flow is turned down to 10%, which gives it this soft terminal at the beginning and edge of the stroke. And um, to me, this is like what digital painting is, is this brush. Um, but uh, I realized that like, hey, not all of you are using it, but to me, it feels like the very beginning of like digital painting for any of you that are beginners. I see lots of people getting diverted in all kinds of different directions with the kind of brush they use. And I thought, hey, let's just do a week where we go back to basics, do a basic photo study. And then the one challenge is y'all are going to have to try to paint using this brush that I think is the, the everything brush personally. Um, in Miguel's work here, I think he's done an excellent job with the overall structure of this piece. The likeness is very good. The, uh, the thing I think is really a standout here is the suit. Uh, wow, what an incredible job rendering these folds. The overall look of the folds is really feels like it's being exaggerated from the reference, and it's being given this like incredible sense of dimension. Um, I would say that this uh, in the black and white version here, especially where the values have been um, simplified a bit for the final one. But when we see it all extra foldy like this, he looks like he's got a little bit of a rumpled suit. Uh, so stylist, like, it, you know, if this was a, a purely a style critique, you know, you know, this guy, I would say he needs to start ironing his clothes. But I think here as an art critique, one of the things, I, I think it's really cool to see how this brush is like producing this very natural um, painterly texture. Uh, I see a lot of brushes that are designed to, to create a little bit of extra texture by, you know, adding in some sort of crunchiness or some sort of, you know, weirdness to it. And the reason why I ended up gravitating in this direction was because I was used to seeing like watercolor and acrylic paintings that had this like natural brushy texture to it. Oh, hey, Miguel. Welcome. Uh, Welcome hi, Peter. Stage. Sorry, I, I'm a little bit late. I forget that it was one hour. <laughs> oh, yeah. The time was a time change this week. I think it's throwing everybody yes. on, all the events off by a little bit. My class this morning had the same problem. So welcome. Yes. So what was your experience with the assignment? Uh, it was really, really fun. Uh, I, I really enjoyed do this one. Um, it's the first time I use just one brush. Yeah. And and I really think will be really difficult for me to to work on on all the piece, uh, ex especially on the on the face. The face was the part that I I, I really. Mm, I, I see too much texture on on the skin and that, and I really don't. Uh, at the beginning, I uh, I don't know how to to work with it, but uh, I use mm, many variations of the opacity with mm -hmm. the brush. Yeah, 
and at the end i really liked the the result and and that uh, showed me that that i can do something with just one basic brush and it's not needed any any other one oh yeah like i i know you've probably seen a lot of people who have like they like collect brush sets right and they're like trying to find the yeah. perfect one um yes, like hundred and <laughs> of brushes in one package. I, I realized that w when I was giving out this assignment, I, I, I noticed a lot of people had um, not really adjusted the flow on the brush too much. Did you end up uh, keeping the flow down low, like around 10%? No, the flow, I, I, I keep the flow on 10%. Yeah. And the only thing that I was changing was the opacity. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see the really like hard edges between some of your brush strokes, and I thought maybe... Yes. The flow had um, uh, had stayed up uh, pretty high. I, I definitely, this is something I'm going to point out other people's work. But yeah, if you ever want to blend using this brush, um, the main the main thing is just to make sure to run counter to the direction that the the folds are running. This is the one um, big secret to it. Is like if you ever feel like you're getting this streaky look and you want to sort of simplify it down. Um, mm -hmm. There is an impulse to want to continue to run, like if there's a long shape to run all the strokes along the length of it. But the advantage of this brush is that if you run it the opposite way, if you run the strokes like this, oh, okay, that it will it will soften things quite a lot. Um, because what happens is you end up creating, you end up using a lot maybe, more of the soft edge of the brush rather than the hard edge. Yes, maybe that's the the thing I do more on this on the face. Yeah. Because on the on the on the suite, I mostly work uh, from top to 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 down uh -huh. in direction, but on the face, I I I I work more different directions, and and I see when I do that on the face, what looks a bit more is is uh, like smooth. On yes. The, on the colors. Uh, and I, I just uh, I wanted to observe a little bit that you you do still you can still see some of the brush strokes running like you like yes. something yes. like here or running up and down the length of the nose. And so if you ever spot any of that and you want to start to blend it in a little bit, all you need to do is it's run kind of the, count, the rather than running parallel to the shape, you kind of run counter to it. And it's nothing mm -hmm. that you have to do with like your settings. Or anything, it really is just the motion of your hand that's the difference between those. Oh, okay. You know, blending it one way or the other, uh, which is my favorite thing about working with a brush like this is that I have really grown accustomed to like the direction of my strokes mattering, and that's yes. like what allows me to create a mixture of hard and soft edges. I thought I was saying before you got here, you did a wonderful job on the suit. I thought that the uh, like the folds Thank they you. they're so believable. Um, a great value control. It's really great to see. Uh, I thought you did an awesome job. Thank you. Yes, it's it's, it's just I I I really uh, try to 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 do the same thing that I, that usually do with other uh, texture brushes, mm -hmm. but using this one. And that, and something that I like it uh, with this uh, uh, hard brush uh, was to to let some some parts. Uh, uh, like messy on on the on the suit, right? Because uh, the the feeling like a texture. So, yes. So that's that's I the reason really why I, I I I sort of found this brush in the first place because I wanted to maintain the texture of like a you know a natural looking painting, and yes. have there be like brush strokes left behind that weren't like um, random and chaotic, but actually like real marks that my hand was making. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, great job, man. Thank you so much for participating Thank you. this week. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, so next up, uh, we have somebody new, uh, Silveride. Uh, Silveride says, first time in the class. I'm still new to art, so there's a lot of things I need to work on, but I really like how this turned out, especially. Uh, just one brush makes the whole digital painting thing less overwhelming. And I just wanted to highlight that. I, I, I want to say, hey, th first off, thanks for joining us. Like, I love to see new faces around here. Um, and yeah, I, I keep wanting to get this message out that digital painting isn't as complicated as people make it out to be. Um, because, you know, you go into Photoshop and you see all these panels, all these controls. And I just want to try to get people to try this out more where they just lean on the brush tool. Just open up the brush tool, open up a new layer, and 
just begin to feel your way through it because there's not a lot more complicated than that than you really need to do in order to get through digital painting. Um, I would say uh, if I have a if I have a suggestion for next time, um, I would say that like it seems as though you're painting underneath the lines here, starting off with a line drawing to find uh, to figure out the structure of the figure is a perfectly fine way to start. Uh, you don't need to keep those things separate. Feel free to go and paint on top of it. If you want to treat it like a traditional canvas, uh, you know, when an oil painter is working, they will often do a sketch first, and then they start building up layers of paint on top of it. As a digital painter, it's even easier because you can make those layers of paint invisible and come back to the lines at any time if you ever need it. I would say that, like, starting off with a drawing is a really good plan, and um, you can integrate it along with your painting, but I think that maybe it's worthwhile to try to just, um, you know, go a little crazy with it next time and, like, go up over the top of it. There's, again, there's a desire to want to, you know, you have this option to keep all these different elements separate, the rendering, the flats, the lines, and have these different layers for it. Uh, but there's a lot of expert digital painters that actually work just on one layer. Personally, I don't work on one layer. I like to build things up layer by layer by layer as I like change to working on different parts of the painting or working with different blending modes. It, it all kinds of stacks up and I usually end up about 20 or 30 layers at the end. And they represent the kind of phases of work as I go through from like sketch to rough black and white to color. They I can peel them back in reverse as I go back in time through it. Um, uh, Vixgo is asking, how do I join? I want to participate. It's easy. I'm going to be giving out a homework assignment at the end. And then uh, you're just going to need to post in the homework channel if anyone would be kind enough to link over to the homework channel for me. Um, uh, you just post it there. And I dig through there right before each, uh, each class every week. We do this at the same time every week. Uh, if you want to get a reminder, go ahead and hit uh, look for the events tab all the way on the sidebar here. Uh, it's all the way at the top. And we do this every single week. All right. Thanks so much. Great job, Silver Eyed. It's, uh, I'm happy to see that you're inspired to study more thanks to this class. Uh, Abart. I think it's Abart. I've always, there's a model of car called an Abart. Oh, it's actually A Barth. Uh, A -Barth. But, you know, okay. close uh, all right, different regional pronunciations. Hey, how was the assignment for you? Uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I usually use this brush, uh, and so it was very comfortable. Okay, good. Um, but I've, I've, I must have been working in black and white because it's I'm sort of new to this stuff, and it seemed easier than jumping into color. Sure. Do you have any questions about jumping into color? Is there anything that's holding you back from it? Uh, it just sort of seems scary. Like it seems like three more dimensions of complexity, and I don't, I don't really know how to start with it. <laughs> um, sure. Well, the the method that I usually do, the, the the main tool I use for adding color to an image, is um, I use uh, blending modes to add color, glazes of color on top. Because if you just add a new normal layer, it will come out kind of chalky and weird looking. Uh, my favorite blending mode for putting on color glazes is hard light. I know the text is probably invisible because my uh, my UI is microscopic here, but I've, I've changed the blending mode on a new layer to hard light. And then um, when you just start to glaze color over the top here, it kind of shines through. It's kind of like using a highlighter. Um, and you can see it works very well in the highlights, but maybe not so much here in the shadows. And so what you typically need to do is you glaze it in a little, like you turn the brush down pretty low and then you can just kind of glaze it in where it looks right. And then where it starts to look bad, you can go and find a different color that will like uh, maybe have a different temperature or, you know, slightly different hue and see if you can find something that works inside there. Maybe even sampling this color back down again and you start getting this darker color out. But I, I'll, I'll usually build up a glaze uh, with that. And there's a few other tools I use. like a, And then I'll, I'll usually use some kind of like um, overall adjustment, like a gradient map, which is under the layer, the um, adjustment layers here. Like a gradient map can be very nice to add a little bit of um, color grading to the overall thing. Gives a little bit of automatic color here. See, so it's like without even having to do make any choices. Um, my gradient maps that I'm using here are all on the website for free. 
Uh, so feel free to grab those if you want them. So I just lo overlay one on the top and then I, I can change it to soft light or overlay and get a little bit of color automatically there. Uh, when you combine the two techniques together, uh, it tends to be pretty powerful. You can see how we get these different shades of blue automatically with just a really simple glaze over the top. Um, this is not like the way of adding color. I, I found there are dozens of ways of doing this. This is the way that I do it um, because it's it's not so systematic. It's kind of like a little chaotic, a little hard to control. And that leads me to having a lot of happy accidents. So and then you come back in with the brush in, in like a normal layer on top of it to start adjusting it or you... Yeah, and then as soon as I like get something that I like, I mean, it did not take much to start to get this thing feeling like it's in color. If we want to add a little red for the uh, bow tie here, you know, we just grab some red, start glazing that up over the top. It starts to light up. And I'm doing a pretty weak job of getting every all the colors in the right place. But yeah, once once there's a normal layer on top of it, then you can just start to sample this just like you are when you're doing all the rendering for the black and white. And you can start sampling the colors from all over and moving them around the canvas to, you know, start to mix everything together. Um, and I usually like to keep things a little bit messy at this stage because as the colors kind of end up in the wrong spot, the process of putting them in the right spot uh, forces me to make like very clean controlled marks that build like the final details. So rather than trying to make sure that my color is applied like cleanly and perfectly, um, the problem with that is then it's like, well, what do I do next? Like the color's not exactly in the right spot because we have all kinds of weird color variations that we may not want. But then you try to move it around and then it starts getting messy. It's like it's easier to make a mess and then clean it up than to like have things organized and try to keep them organized as you like rearrange everything. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I'll have to give this a try. Yeah, uh, Del Mas is saying Procreate does not have them. Oh, they do. It does have them, but it forces you to flatten everything. One of the reasons I like um, Photoshop and CSP uh, is because and Krita is that they allow you to do things like adjustment layers like gradient maps as their own separate thing. And then you can, you know, decide, uh, I don't want it. I want to change it to something else and experiment with it kind of on the fly to figure out what it's working for you. But yeah, I, I thought you did a great job on this. Um, and I was really happy that you showed the process because it's a, it's a really clean, organized process. Thanks. Um, I think if you wanted to improve it further, the main thing I would suggest is I really like the way that you're blocking out everything on the face. But then once we start getting down into like the arm, um, we aren't getting quite as much uh, organization as we're, we're getting here. And then I think it carries over into once you start trying to build the rendering on top of it because you don't have quite as much to latch on to inside like these larger open spaces. Yeah, I felt like when I was rendering the arm, I was having to do much more drawing because I didn't. There wasn't enough information in the drawing to yeah. So getting, know what the folds were things like that. Getting the drawing in a little earlier and fussing with the drawing um, will save you time in the long run. I think there's something I was going to say to somebody else down the line as well is that um, the more you kind of invest in the early stages, the faster the whole thing goes because then you end up having to fuss a lot less once you get to these later stages. That makes sense. All right. Any yeah, questions? I think this is, uh, no, this is super helpful. Thank you so much. No, yeah, thank you. Great work. All right. Move it back. Okay. You got it. Uh, next up, uh, Anathe. Anathe was saying, uh, using the brush without pressure control was pretty challenging. And I got carried away by fiddling around with colors. It took me around seven hours to finish. I think it's honestly the most content content with what I did. Though there's uh, still a lot of spots I want to fix, but I'll leave it for now. Wow, seven hours of work. I'm absolutely honored. But I'm also wondering what you're talking about with no, no pressure sensitivity. Because, I mean, maybe it's just, yeah, okay. So it doesn't have the, it doesn't do the opacity. Um, but the pressure sensitivity is there. It, the pressure sensitivity is just like if you were to use a real acrylic or oil brush, like, or any kind of traditional brush. If you use a traditional round brush, uh, they're shaped kind of like this. They're shaped like this. And so when you drag the tip of it along, 
you get this thin mark. And then when you smush the brush down, you get this fat mark that comes off of it. And, you know, it doesn't require us to do some sort of elaborate simulation of that. So uh, to me, it, 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 I think it just makes um, the most sense. I'm noticing uh, you do have some little softer terminals in some spots, but I think that one of the things that's getting you here that's making it a little tougher is that um, I think you have the flow up too high. I think I'm going to say this a few times. Make sure to keep that flow low so that you end up with a soft edge and a hard edge to your stroke. That makes a huge difference in terms of like, you know, when you're trying to do a lot of rendering on something like the face that you're not having to like um, you know, select. And if, if I were to turn the flow all the way up, it becomes a lot harder to blend just because like you have to like be so much more fiddly about all of it. Uh, the other thing I'm wondering is some of you who are um, struggling a little bit with blending uh, using this brush, I wonder if um, perhaps you're not leaning as hard on the alt key as I typically do. Um, I have my thumb on the alt key pretty much all the time when I'm working. And so when you when you when if you've ever watched me paint, what you see is like the brush disappears and I do a color sample very quickly, very, very often. So I'm constantly scanning for those little in-between colors to be able to make um, quick selection and blend. And it doesn't require a lot of time to be able to get like even fairly large complex areas smoothed out. Like the difficult part for me is always figuring out where does this, where do all the colors need to be in the first place? How do we get all the, the range, all the features, all the values, everything. And then when it comes to actually blending stuff, I always think that that's like the fastest and easiest part because like it's really, to me, it's like this brush makes it really easy to just kind of like smudge things around in a highly controlled way. They still leave a little bit of a mark, but um, yeah, I think, I think that there's something about the technique, the way you're using this, that is slowing you down as far as your blending is concerned. Um, but I thought, wow, the look of these early process uh, shots is so incredible. Um, they're so striking looking and like the underlying drawing is so strong. Uh, this, the, your strength as an artist is really showing through here. And I, I thought these were so cool to see. I love the technique of starting off in color with the saturation turned all the way up and then sort of painting into it and letting some of those color bits still show through. Very classical technique, traditional technique. And um, I thought that even here digitally, it overcame some of the natural shortcomings of digital color blending in a way that like, um, you know, left a really cool result. Seeing these like bits of pink showing through between the brush strokes, ah, it's very tasty to look at. And it's because it's an artifact of like your hand of your painting process, it looks even more beautiful than like something that's just a custom brush or some sort of artifact from you know, some a some artificial affect that's being added after the fact. Like, I really think that um, when you can see the artist's hand, even little shortcomings where you don't quite get all the coverage, I always think that those moments in a painting are beautiful. And so I love uh, the way that you put this together. Uh, so thank you so much. Anyone else having trouble with audio? Yeah, every every week there's always somebody who's like who's like oh, I can't hear anything. Uh, Tristan, is Tristan here? Um, Tristan didn't have any commentary, but I did want to highlight something that I noticed on Tristan's work here. Um, Tristan is doing uh, is doing some very. Um, how what's the best word to describe this? It's like very specific color picking. So um, there's these zones of color here that are kind of being built up. And this is this is definitely like um, a way to work. And for some people, this is a thing that this is gonna a feature of their work that's always gonna end up showing through. Uh, these these sort of blocks of color that are kind of all butted up next to each other. And uh, it's a really cool style, but the place where I think it's uh, potentially letting Tristan down is in the way that it's like harder to turn the form overall. 
And by that, I mean like we have the, the light coming in from over here, right? And then as the light, as we move around the figure this way, we're getting a shadow side over here. And uh, that transition can be fairly soft. So what we're looking for is this kind of waves within waves phenomenon that I've talked about a little bit in the past, where we have this transition from um, light to dark. Um, and but but like we're not we're not rendering an orb here. We're not rendering a cylinder. You know, with a complex organic shape like this, you know, we're what we're trying to do is we're trying to create these subtleties of building in like all of the waves of the folds, but we're also trying to turn the entire form together. And so when you are using these this really limited selection of colors, like this color and this color are the same, it's a lot harder to get that rotation around the whole form because um, what we might end up with is that like the uh, highlights on the shadow side are the same value as the shadows on the light side. And um, it's a little bit counterintuitive. And so when we're looking at this as a series of color zones that are broken down like this, it can be difficult for us to figure like slowly transition as we move around the larger forms. So I usually recommend that you start off by trying to figure out what those big transitions are first and then break them down into smaller pieces. So figure out what the whole, figure out the lighting for the, the whole side of the figure and the whole shadow side of the figure, like get the whole thing kind of transitioning left to right across the whole thing, and then go and chop it up down into smaller pieces to be able to, to get your finer folds and smaller shapes and more refined rendering. I hope that's helpful. All right. Um, keep going down the line here. We have, ooh, this one's very, very low resolution. Jim, uh, what was Jim saying? <laughs> All right. Working with this brush has been so much fun. Uh, first was really frustrating as the opacity jitter on, um, he's used to opacity jitter. I had to be more conscious about how I was. <laughs> uh, is Jim here? Jim, if you wanna raise your hand, you can come on stage. Uh, how I was. <laughs> oh my God, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, advice for the future, please upload your paintings at a higher resolution. I don't know if I screwed this up or, hey, there you are. Uh, probably we'll work on it some more tomorrow. It started out as skeptic, but now I'm a con now I'm converted. Ooh, very nice. Yeah, um, I, it, it's, I think that seeing all of these chunky brush strokes is always really gorgeous. And so um, I'm glad that you're finding uh, that like once you start piling them together, it uh, it really can accumulate into an overall painty look that's very, very appealing to the eye. I think that um, one of the things that might help you here is you have the, even though you don't have the opacity on, you do need to control the opacity a little bit more. Um, I typically, you, I'm usually using a keyboard while I'm working. I'm on the wrong brush. I usually use a keyboard while I'm working uh, that allows me to turn the opacity down when I need to start blending stuff. So if you wanted to start blending out some of these shapes a little bit, it's just a matter of getting that opacity turned down, maybe 40%, and then um, making sure that your flow is down to 10%, and then you can start to just mush that stuff around. One little Alt key press, and then you can start to like mush and transition areas very softly while also retaining a really high level of control. So that's the real that's the real magic here is it's able to make these chunky brushy marks, but it's also able to do a very, very fine level of blending. Oh, it's a screenshot. Um, your, your flow is at 50%, aha. So yeah, the flow is actually, here's a more nuance to this. 
The flow is largely dependent on the brush spacing. So if we zoom in really close here, what we can see as I, let's get really, really close. We really wanna see these pixels assemble. So we can see that the brush is actually a stamp that is repeating over itself over and over and over and over again. The space between those stamps is the, um, is the spacing here. I have my spacing down at 5%. I think it originally defaults down to 20%. Um, this is like how a lot of the round brushes are. I remember back in the day, I never adjusted my spacing. And so I would have to go through and I would have all these, these marks like this with these like weird little flower petal shaped patterns. And then I'd have to go over them a second time to try to blend them out again. And that was like part of the rigor of rendering for me was getting rid of this. And then I just decided, hey, I'm gonna turn the, the spacing down. But um, the flow is dependent on the spacing because the flow is how many stamps go over the same spot, um, need to go over the same spot in order to build up to its full opacity. So if the stamps are further apart, then, the, then the, um, if the spacing is higher, then the flow can be higher. And if the spacing is lower, the flow needs to be lower in order to create the same effect. So if we wanted to get really crazy about this and turn the spacing down to 1% and we wanted the brush fall off to be similar, we would have, probably have to turn the flow down to like 2%. And so we can get like a super smooth mark like this. It's a little bit harder on the CPU. And it's not really that necessary, but we get about the same fade in, fade out um, distance by turning the flow down and when we turn the spacing down. But for the sake of CPU and the sake of like keeping things fairly simple, I usually keep it about 5% spacing, 10% flow. I know that is, um, that it's pretty in the weeds, but hey, education. Thanks so much for the effort uh, this week, Jim. I'm glad that you, uh, you had a good experience with it. I personally love using a brush like this. And I think that like uh, the the alternate brush that I use to this is my spongy brush. And it's literally the same brush, but it's a square one with some texture on it. This is like my face. Like you can actually do variations on this brush if you like it that uh, use different shape tips and also use different amounts of texture over the top of it. And it still feels just about the same. But the that round brush, it's the most basic one. Oh, fate. This is the one where I, I was really like, ooh, I wonder if I did not do a thorough explanation on all of the blending stuff. And now that we have gone over it so many times, I'm not going to beleaguer the point. I think that doing this all entirely with 100% opacity and, and nearly 100% flow, um, that is an incredible challenge. I love that, they, that uh, Fate went and did all this additional texture on like the skin tone and on the hair and and really like I think they had the difficulty level on this turned up even higher than I intended but still uh you know powered through and made this <laughs> yeah you made it on extra extra hard mode so um my recommendation is that yeah this is the basic basic brush make sure you got that pressure opacity on make sure that you turn the flow down I just did a sh shift one to turn it down to 10% and then make, and then you can also use the opacity a little bit. So maybe like, you know, 40% opacity. And then now you're off to the races to being able to blend stuff just by grabbing the color with the alt key and smushing it. And you can see it's very, very easy to soften things up and blend them around. Um, and I'm, I, I saw a couple of these and I was like, oh boy, that one's on me. So uh, no mistake on your part. That was a mistake on mine. Uh, Lex is saying, so far I've always used flow at 100% and 100% hard brush. So this is really impressive to me. <laughs> yeah, that is, um, I mean, that's how it comes out of the box, right? You know, they hand you Photoshop and you're just like, okay, well, this is what a brush does. And it's like, uh, you know, well, how are they doing the blending? They must be using the smudge tool, right? You know, it must be smudging. But uh, you can see how difficult it is to create a gradient using something like a smudge tool, but it's very easy to create a gradient when you just, um, when you are, have the brush at the right set with the right settings, it's very easy to make very smooth, long gradients that are fully under your control. It only takes, takes a little bit of petting. 
if you want to build something really smooth, but totally different experience than something like the smudge tool. All right, Delia. Delia's regular around here. Delia, if you want to hop on stage, feel free. Hey there. Yeah, hello. Uh, you spent about three hours? Yeah. Digging in deep. Um, you were mentioning your comment about the complexion on the skin. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's not terrible, but I felt like it's a bit like dull in comparison to the reference. Like yes. the nose and the around the mouth, it's it's like a different hue, and I couldn't quite capture that. And I was cute myself at max three hours too. So I uh, had a piece of advice for you. Um, yeah. Uh, on this in specific, and I thought this would be useful for everybody. Uh, what I have always started to do, especially with studies, because studies are like who cares territory. You know, it's like I'm going to do something wrong and whatever. I'll like live with it, but like. I, I just try to overshoot the color on like a few spots around when I, cause like that's the main fear I have is that it's going to end up too dull. So what I try to do is I have some like overly pure tones that are kind of scattered around in order to create some, what, what they call in the business visual mixing. Um, and visual mixing is like, yeah, it's, there's no spot on the reference that is this color. Like there's not a single pixel that is this color orange. But if you overshoot the color by a bit and you add in spots um, that are like, you're like, oh, there's some there's some cooler tones inside there. And it's like, well, if you find, if you wanted to add like bits of purple in, like go for it. If you want to add some bits of orange, you want to add some bits of yellow, go with a purer tone than you need, especially early on. Because like um, when I, I did this study myself on the on Tuesday, and um, for a lot of this stuff, I was like, well, there are a lot of color hints, like the same way that you know, like a some like a sommelier is describing the taste of a fine wine. They're like, oh, it's got yeah. <laughs> notes of grapefruit and aged leather or whatever, right? It's like. What I want you to do is I want you to look at the colors next to each other and be like, oh, this part of the forehead's a little bit more yellowy, while this part's a little bit more purpley. And I want you to see, to like find that color on the color picker and like try to figure out what's the pure tone that's like hiding just underneath the surface and like grab too much of that and bring it into the canvas and like make sure that it's on the canvas somewhere. Because then you're able to grab these things and blend them over, like do a little bit of a glaze or something to bring out like, oh, does this need to be a little less gray? Well, maybe it needs to feel a little bit more yellow, but also there's parts of it along the edge that feel a little bit more orange. And you can like, you can use the visual mixing to like have really pure tones that are all kind of jammed next to each other. You can even use totally opposing tones like this and um, keep little bits that are actually cobbled together and create a little bit of a color mosaic. Those will mix together naturally in the eye, which is why it's called you know visual mixing, is that it like, when you get at a distance, the average color between them looks like the right color, even though each specific color is wrong. And it always okay, looks yeah. good. So I say just overdo it and like, make sure that you have like more pure color values, like just kind of snuck in around and peeking out of the cracks in your painting. And then, you know, you won't feel this like, well, it's too dull. Like, okay, now it's like too psychedelic. But like, if it's a little too psychedelic, you're like a couple of short washes away of like bedding it back down. It, it's easier to flatten things than to like pull them out, right? And so yeah. I'd say start too colorful, start too psychedelic early. And then let it kind of blend together and flatten out as you continue to work with it and eat it around. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Um, no, it was mostly just a skin tone. That was the main okay, bits. Cool. Well, great job as usual. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for participating every week. It's great to see you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Chong Gillespie uh, says, definitely see why you swear by this brush. Hard and soft edges, naturally round shapes, very useful or really useful. Yeah, um, I just wanted to put this one up here because of the praise. Um, but the uh, no, the 
like the uh, the likeness here is really striking. The blending on the face is so creamy. Oh my god! Like there is some amazing subtlety happening here in the blending. I just wanted to highlight it. I thought it looked gorgeous. Uh, you can really see that um, Chong really pushed their chips all in on the face um, and then left a, everything else a little flatter, which is a totally fine creative choice. I honestly wonder, you know, what does it look like? Like this, this makes me think like with the similarity in value between the shirt and the background, you get this very kind of graphic look where the, where it almost looks like we are seeing through the figure and seeing the, the, the wall behind him, which is a very cool, um, very cool look. And then I'm thinking like, uh, in, if, if you don't really want to put too much time into the suit, it might be worth it to just do a slightly flatter, more graphic look for the suit overall to just like be like, okay, I only have time to render the face. Can I make the rest of it look like it's supposed to be half-assed or like, <laughs> can I make it, can I make the rest of it like a lot simpler without like calling attention to itself? And the answer is probably, yeah. I think um, I think like you you already did a little bit of simplification on the suit. If you actually did like less rendering and made it more graphic, combined with the incredibly creamy rendering on the face, I think the whole thing already very strong could have been even stronger. Um, and then you you wouldn't. Um, it seems like there's a couple areas where you are fighting a little bit with the piece, like over here on the sleeve. You know, you, you can just maybe um, bow out of that a little bit and simplify it all down, simplify the number of wrinkles, block block up the shapes a little blockier, keep it all a little flatter, and then, you know, chalk it up to style. Did the face got bored? <laughs> Should have made focus on the graphic shapes. And hey, listen, that's the thing is with a study, it, it technically it's about you learning and not about making a strong impression. It's just that it can also be like a test bed for like, I'm working on a commission. I need to make this look really good and intentional, but I also do not want to spend this much time on something that only pay, is going to give me $300. You know, like I want to, I'm going to like break it down a little simpler in parts, push all my chips into like the key areas of the painting and then like call it a day and like that level of focus and like and planning i think is actually a super useful strategy outside of this so uh just that's my two cents i mean you did such an amazing job on this and i know that you could have got, taken it even further if you had, had more time um i'd have used another brush for graphic shapes but that was against the rules yeah that's possible yeah, I could see that. I mean, especially with something that's maybe a little bit square edged or like a triangular tip. Um, I honestly, one of the things I need to add to my brush library is like just differently shaped versions of the same brush. Like the more I talk about it, the more I'm thinking that that's a thing I, I would want to add. Oh, I saw you typing. I was like pausing for a second to read it before I move on. But um, otherwise, well, you're typing again. <laughs> Feel free to type and then we move on. Oh, well, my pleasure. Thank you. Really great work. Uh, next up, uh, Niantra, a regular around here. Niantra, are you around? I The time change is throwing people. I'm convinced the time change is throwing people because I've, I've seen some of you are here, have been here so faithfully every single week and I'm like so honored. Oh, wait, no, Niantra's here. <laughs> if you want to hop on stage you can otherwise you don't have to um big comment what was i what was i think I, I was i was reading the big comment and there was something in it and now i need to reread it to remember where i was with it um do you have any advice on making adjustment to a piece late in the rendering process ah that was it i do have advice on this okay so this happens to me all the time this happened to me on this piece where my guy's head was a crazy shape and then I needed to move it later on. Um, your question was saying that you it create you can resize it, but then it creates a gap across many layers that you have to fill and re-render across a tiny little gap. Yes, it's super annoying, isn't it? I have a hack and this hack has, has carried me for years. 
Um, and it's, it's actually one of the reasons why I work the way that I do. So my, my hack, this works at every stage of the process from the very beginning when you're trying to like move stuff around with the sketch all the way up to the very end is just lasso tool, copy merge, paste. And you end up with a chunk and you go, okay, well now I can transform this, whether you need to like transform warp it or whatever. And with the drawing, you can just be like, whatever, it's fine. I don't need to cover this patch. But if you want to do the same thing with the rendered version, you can see that like, as soon as we start to like move and rotate stuff, we start getting this like weird cut in it that we don't like. And I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do some wrong things here just to exaggerate like the effect that we're getting is that we end up with this edge that runs along the thing that you then need to like figure out how to deal with. And um, I mean, first steps first, just try to make sure that you put it somewhere where it's not gonna call too much attention to itself. But then this is the reason why I'm always painting on the top layer because you can take a patch like this and just using the same brush, just sample and scrub it out. Um, instead of going back through and if you have a sketch underneath, you know, resizing the sketch and then you have flats and you have to redo the flats. If you uh, have like a pretty intuitive brush and everything is kind of brushy, it is really, really fast to paint out a seam on a patch like this. If just as long as you're only on the top layer. Because if you have to go through an entire layer stack and make these kinds of alterations, you're in trouble. But you can see that like making an adjustment to a patch like this is actually relatively fast. If you just hit it with the Alt key and just get to work quick, you can bust through it in no time. And then, you know, it looks like a total mess if you only look at the one layer. But across, like, the main thing is that I will sometimes find in the corner of a painting, in a, on a, I'll look at a print, and on the print I will see the seam that runs, like, here, and I'll be like, oh, my God, I rotated a layer at some point, and I only half painted out the seam, and I, I didn't notice it from far away, and then I got up, and I, look, I looked at it at a print, and I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> there's, a, there's a seam from, like, a patch that I, like, uh, I transformed early in the process and that I didn't quite get. And it's just there forever and it's on somebody's print. They don't notice, they don't care, thankfully. People are not looking at all the little corners and edges and finding the seams and stuff, but with our own art, we have a different relationship. So um, it I, I say just for a lot of stuff with, with digital painting, uh, take the quick and easy route out. And so uh, the I'm going to go over it one more time here uh, for because we do have some beginners with us. The solution is that you use a lasso tool. Lasso in everything that you want to transform. I use uh, copy merge, which is under here. Copy merged. Default hotkey is shift control C, which is going to copy the values of every single layer all the way down to the base. If you do regular copy, it's only going to copy that layer um, but copy merge will copy every layer in the stack together as you see it and then when you hit uh, control v you'll end up with a chunk that will be all your layers combined together that you can then move and transform if you need to like you could hit control t and then you can immediately start like you know giving him a tinier head or something um, the other thing that i'll do to try to get these patches looking a little bit better is I will hit the eraser tool and I'll hit the soft brush. And then if you just do a soft brush and erase out a little bit, you can end up um, like you see on this this area over here. And I'll just erase out the hard edge on the on the patch and it'll auto kind of blend it for me. And so I'll use the soft brush on the eraser to be able to like give myself a little bit of softness on the patch to be able to um, have a more blended edge so that if I need to like move stuff around and blend it, it's a little easier. 
there's a there's a uh, I'll go through and transform every layer. Yeah, um, there is. I guess there's a plugin for that. I this is. I'm telling you, like, I there is a reason why I just always work on the top layer. It allows me to mimic a lot of traditional painting techniques, but it also allows me to do purely digital hacks like this, where I just you know exacto out a chunk of a painting stretch it like Laffy Taffy and then glue it back down to the surface and I get away with it. <laughs> I get away with it every time. So great question, Yantra. Thank you so much. Great work as always. Uh, Raccoon, I want to pull this out. I just love the rendering style on this. This was a really unique rendering style among all of them. Um, feel free to pop, uh, raise your hand if you want to pop up on stage and chit chat for a second here. We are running a little short on time. I think we're running about on time. Yeah, can't talk. It's fine. Um, I just wanted to point out, I really love the the stylization on the mark making here. Um, you know, I was asking everyone to use round brush, and you would have thought that everyone's paintings would have looked the same because they were all using the same tools. But in my experience, when everyone uses the same tool, everyone's paintings will always still look different. That, like, there's a certain amount of, like, the look of a painting that comes from the individual, individual, visuality of the way we move our hands and another part of just the way that we see and process visual information and when you add those two things together you can end up with really remarkably different work even if we're all kind of putting the same intention into it so um i know everyone's always worried about their style and whatnot i think style always develops very naturally i'm sure that you had a fairly natural progression in building your style from the various things that you liked and the things that came naturally to you and things that came easily. And uh, I always love to see people's style on display. It's one of my favorite things to see when I'm looking at artwork is to see an artist who has a distinctive style, who's like making very distinct choices about the way they want their work to look. And um, and yeah, this is, I, I knew that we were gonna get, get some variation, even with using a fairly basic tool like this round brush, um, you can still create very, very different looks depending on, uh, you know, the choices you make and the way you work through it. I'm looking through the chat right now. Yeah, thank you so much. This is a really cool piece. Um, I want to see more studies from you in like a stylized way. It's something I've always personally had trouble with is making a stylized version of a study. I'm always very trying to get it right, like on a grid you know, as though like the proportions of everything are exactly right. And, you know, what angle is this thing, lay, com the shoulder coming in exactly? And so this kind of um, stylized study to me is always a little bit of black magic. I've never quite been able to wrap my head around it. So it's always, I always love seeing it. Uh, we got a great study here from Edzia423. First time participating. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I didn't know what to do. Uh, I didn't know what to do, so I did it realistically. I mean, you can do it however you want. I thought the realism here came out great. I add a sketch and a close-up on the face. I spent some time, longest time working on it. I used Procreate, so I didn't have a brush that perfectly matched the criteria, which is fine. Um, by the way, I always use texture brushes way out of my comfort zone. That's good. I'm glad I've helped. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I was able to help you bring you out of your comfort zone. Uh, Procreate's fine. I find that the big difference in Procreate is that it does something weird with the flow. Like it, it it's like it, uh, um, it wants to add a little bit of extra pressure, like opacity jitter. Even when you tell it to stop, it always wants to add a little bit of that in there to make it a little bit more like the way that a pencil feels and a little less like a paintbrush. Um, I think that's just sort of the feel of the program. You've done uh, something that I like to do, which is use a soft brush early on to work out those sort of larger, softer shapes. This is something I was talking about with a previous crit of like, how do you get the, the form to turn overall? How do you get like, you know, building out the a soft, rough version of the piece loosely with a softer brush is the one time where I think a soft brush really excels. And so... I've got started to get in the habit of this as well. And I, I love this working method, you know, building out a really quick, loose um, drawing, filling it in with some uh, values using like looser, softer brushing, and then coming in and tightening it down on the detail. Um, if there's anything I would critique, I would say that 
Uh, the colors to me feel a little flat, um, especially like we can see on the, let's see, am we gonna have a counterpoint here? Oh, there was one that was from uh, Yusuf's, Yusuf's study. I thought I pulled it out. I wanted to highlight it because it was an example of this done really, really well. And I wonder if I screwed up and I didn't copy it or something. Ooh, sorry, Yusuf, your, your study this week was incredible. Um, but uh, what, I, what, what I'm talking about is um, when you are adding color, certain blending modes tend to give a kind of flat overall color appearance. Um, and this is, this is doubled if you don't um, glaze in slightly different colors for the shadows or use any kind of uh, adjustment layers or, or a, like a color balance or gradient map or whatever to start to infuse different hues inside of the shadows. And so it can be really tough to get a more um, dynamic range of color between the highlights and the shadows just through normal color picking. I'm going to turn this down a little bit. Um, I want to go and pull up, I'm going to pull up Yusuf's as a positive example of this just because I'm kind of failing at um, doing it on the fly here. Bear with me. I'm running late. It's towards the end of the class. Here we go. Uh, dun -dun. Ah, here we go. So in Yusuf's, you can see that in the shadowed areas here, we get this purple overlay. And then um, some of the shadows in here, we're getting a little bit of the yellow. And just going and getting a slightly different hue as we move um, between the highlights and shadows on the form, end up creating a really great dynamic, like um, the, the more dynamic color gives us a little bit more sculpting to the to the figure. Like you can tell that the planes of the figure are really turning as like we shift from this like cooler blue to this warmer or this cooler gray to this warmer gray. And then back again on this plane shift here on the pocket where we go from like this really warm gray to this really cool gray that this color temperature shift um, indicates a kind of plane change and it adds a lot of volume to the overall figure. And the, the same is happening as well in the differences between the, um, the parts of the face where we're getting kind of uh, scattering and seeing the warmth of the skin versus these um, more direct reflections in the sort of specular uh, reflections across the forehead. And so we have this like diversity between the warm and the cool variations of the same colors. Um, that can add a lot. And if you are struggling to pull that in with your current work method, my recommendation is to uh, try out different blending modes and also be a little mindful about watching your color temperature more than your hue. Uh, I've heard, and I believe this is true, that um, the, most important, uh, the most important attribute of your color is the value, right? Which is why we do values first. But then after that, um, the temperature is actually more important to it reading correctly than the hue is. So if you can only focus on warm versus cool temperature variations, you're going to end up getting a stronger result than getting um, like perfectly dialed in like hue and saturation. Like it, it's en it ultimately ends up being a simpler way of thinking about color variation than trying to figure out exactly where you are inside a color picker. But if you can simply like find cooler and warmer variations of the same hue and really lean on that a little bit more, I mean, you have it going, hmm? oh, it, it, uh, that will end up giving you, um, I think, a little bit stronger overall sense to the color and more of a sense of volume to the figure and a greater sense of like naturalism to the overall painting. So color temperature, it's like oddly important. I don't know why, but it's something that we as people are generally fairly sensitive to. Uh, thank you so much, Edzia. I hope that the feedback is helpful and I hope I'll continue to see you around. 
All right, we got one more, and then it's going to be on to the assignment. Um, yes, color temperature, and it's like kind of arbitrary. Uh, paper had an absolute blast with this. Uh, paper, are you, are you here? Do you want to pop on stage? Bring you up. People have been quiet today. Paper, welcome. You are muted. There you go. Yep. There we go. You oh got God, it. Everything was. <laughs> How's it going? How was the assignment? Uh, it was great. Um, I am very used to using simple brushes. Um, I when I first started digitally painting, I always used the uh, simple round brush, but my go-to nowadays is the simple square brush. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel very comfortable with uh, and and pr actively promote using like a single brush uh, in working. You know, um, I always think I need to be using more brushes because I feel like I have not enough brush diversity inside my painting. But mm -hmm. I wanted to just like go back to basics this week. I don't think it's important that for every single assignment or every single painting people use a single brush. But um, it can be nice to get away from the kind of like brush universe for a minute because I feel like there's right. like a bit of social pressure to, to like have all the right brushes. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah, oh, like some of my with you uh, friends. Square gang. <laughs> yeah, like some of my friends are like, "Oh, what brushes do you use?" And I'm like, like "The I'm round like, one." Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm like the two square or three. One. And, yeah, yeah, I'd say I'd say square gang and 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 round gang unite. Like, I think we're taking over. It's a good it's a good look. Um, uh, do you have any questions about the work? Um. Not particularly, but I, there's one thing I just like experimented with this that I kind of wanted some thoughts on was like um, on on his face. I, I tried to do something that I haven't done before, which uh, somebody else did. And so I literally just slapped down uh, underneath my sketch layer, just the most like saturated blue. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, OK, I'm going to put all these like browns and and reds and stuff over it so that in like the shadows i get like this like flavor of the of the saturated blues coming through um yeah kind of if you do that with oil paint the light will literally pass through the top layer and then bounce off the bottom layer and scatter back up and you will mm -hmm. get a glowing effect that will actually emerge from the surface of the painting and it's right. it's gorgeous but with digital like the only way to see the blue underneath is to actually kind of like leave cracks of it. And there are places where there's cracks where it's showing through. Yeah. Um, and so unfortunately we're not able to get as much of that as digital painters, like that same prismatic effect of having it like the light actually bounce through multiple layers of translucent paint. I wish, yeah, I wish that was something I'm, I do want to like, do in the future going to traditional media and be able to get those kind of things but yeah, yeah. I, it, it's a cool idea i think um if you wanted to get more out of it i think you would have to you know be a little bit more judicious with your your mark making and like cover over less of it right yeah like i i've i've never actually like worked uh traditionally in like painting and stuff which I really want to, but I don't have like the space right. or like resources to. But it's like I always try and use those like traditionally like techniques. Right. If you yeah. wanted to play around with it, there's a couple options that are, are like not too tough. Like I think that mm -hmm. the easiest way to experiment with traditional media is acrylic because um, it's not picky about quality of the brands, and um, right. it doesn't. It's not doesn't have noxi noxious fumes, which means you can do it in indoors without ventilation just fine. Okay. And um, uh, my favorite way to do it is with something called a stay wet palette. It's like a, it's like a Tupperware container right. that has a sponge in the bottom. And um, and then you lay a piece of paper over the top of the sponge and it, it like your globs of paint will stay wet forever in the palette. And then oh. when you lay them on the canvas, they like dry instantly. Oh, cool. And so okay. to me, it's a lot more like digital painting than other mediums working in acrylic with the stay wet palette because you can just sort of smush this around forever and then you go to paint stuff and it's like, okay, now it's just there and it doesn't like smush around or blend too much 
after a second or two, you can just go in and grab another color and then just start going again. Awesome. And do a lot of the same stuff that you're doing here. And yeah, you don't need to like spend a, sh a shitload of money or like, you know, w worry about ventilation or a special space. Like you can get some small, you can work on paper, you can work on board. It's just made of plastic. It's it acrylic paint is right. just plastic in a tube. Um, and uh, so you can get whatever's cheap and get a little set yeah. and mess around with it. And you, you're not going to, you're not going to break anything. It's going to be fine. Just don't, cool. don't do it when you're wearing clothes that you really care about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. I might actually look into doing that. Thank you. All right. Super yeah. helpful. Yeah. I, I've found, I, I jumped into it kind of late and I found that like after years of digital painting, it all kind of made sense pretty quickly. Um, but like there was really a back and forth of like the more I learned with traditional media, the, the better like digital, like I feel like I get as a digital painter and sort of vice versa. Yeah. So like spreading out across a couple different mediums can be really educational. If you're, if you're inclined to try it out, I recommend it. Yeah. That, that's like exactly why I want to get into it. Cause I've, I've heard the whole, like, if you do other mediums, it kind of like applies and yeah. The knowledge morphs over so i want to try that i would say if i have any recommendations for you uh, from this piece it's that i would like to see you spend a little bit more time on the structure of the work at the be at the very beginning that um the likeness overall the structure of the piece uh could be stronger and so if you were to spend a little bit more once you lay in a sketch feel free to like critique yourself on like figure out try to be really really diligent about figuring out where you've got the proportions off and then with the sketch in place like go ahead and go ahead and lasso chunks of it it's really easy to lasso when you've got like uh you know if you need to make a head smaller or bigger when it's all just sketch lines it's really easy to sort of lasso and rearrange uh, okay. rather than having to constantly like scratch it out and erase it and redraw it 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 just Keep it really simple and really fast, but give it another lap or two right there at that on that those first uh, that first layer. Gotcha. Okay. All right. I'll try that. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right. So that's it for the the critiques. I'm going to give out the assignment for next week. Uh, I asked my wife about this, and she said, "Hey, there. We sh you should be doing a uh, landscape thing one of these days. And so I said, okay, today is the day where we're going to be doing the landscape. I'm posting this image in the chat and I'm posting it in the homework channel too. Where's the homework channel? There it is. Um, and so the assignment is I want you to do a study of a landscape. You can use this one. This is a nice, simple one. Um, but I want you to change all the lighting. I want you to um, paint this scene, but I want you to completely redo the time of day. So the light should be uh, approaching all of these hills from a different side. Uh, the lighting color should, you know, be different. You could even change it to a different season if you wanted to. And so I want you to study the geometry of this space without really looking at it as just like a collection of colors and values, but think about like what is making it up. Like the point of trying to change it here is that uh, sometimes when we look at references, we're not just copying the patterns of light and dark. We're not just making a series of squiggly lines here and filling them in paint by numbers. We're having to think about the volume of the thing and like, um, and so I, I decided to keep it kind of simple uh, for this assignment because this is a challenging exercise. And uh, I'm going to make sure to write this up inside the inside the homework before right as soon as we get out of here. <laughs> um, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to ask them now. You can raise your hand, pop up on stage, make it easy, or you can write them out. But yeah, you can, uh, you can, Miguel Firewolf. It's a cat. I'll bring you up right afterwards. Uh, yes, Peter. Quick question. So we're going to, to work on this one for a different season, lighting and shadowing? Uh, yes. So it doesn't need to be a different season necessarily, but I want you to be keeping the three-dimensional structure of this scene, but I want you to be painting a different scene. So it's like, maybe it's oh. fall, maybe it's, sunset 
you know, totally different lighting. Um, you shouldn't be following the patterns of light and dark here. You should be thinking about what are the shapes only and then painting different light on top of it. Like, for example, if the, if the light was coming from the left instead of that from the right. Right, exactly. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And it's a cat. I clicked on you. There you go. I was wondering how much like funsies could we have with this? Like if we keep the base shapes the same, can we like change different elements about it? Like add some more like fantastical or oh, absolutely. Like, creative elements into it? Yeah. Because I was trying to find like how do I make this a thing that I'm like actually interested in? And I'm like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> random fantasy cool brushwork stuff yeah i was worried that maybe this is like too simple of an image because like honestly it's it's a pretty simple image but i don't we we've got a mixture of like pretty advanced and, and pretty beginner people here um so uh if you want to make it extra advanced by like adding fantastical elements to this go crazy Alrighty, thank you so much all right have a good night thank you you too all right. And then we got another question up here. Toby. Um, hello. Um, are we allowed to build any like 3D for this or you just want a painting? Um, I mean, I'm a painter. I don't know anything about 3D, so I would have a really hard time critiquing 3D work. Oh, sure. Then we'll just paint it. And I hope um, this less like these type of free classes will keep going on, or is it just a one time thing? No, no, I do them every week. Oh, awesome! Um, yep. That's really good to hear. And so, uh, if you want to RSVP for it, so you get reminders. There's if you go on the events tab at the top of the Discord, uh, you'll see this event, and uh, you can RSVP for it. Uh, and oh, we got a, Dustin's got a link here in the chat. And uh, yeah, come by and join us every week. I, it's one hour a week. Oh, that's awesome! Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Marino's got a question. We got a lot of questions this week. Hey, Marino. You are muted at the moment. There you go. Hi. Hey. Um, it's my first time here, and I wanted to ask, can we change the clouds? Yes. In the sky. Please. I would love to see some cool clouds. Okay. That's great. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Oh yeah, another question, Lex. <laughs> and then I think we're gonna go. <laughs> I don't want to hold you all up. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yes. It's hello. My first time as well. Uh, so what do I? What should I keep in mind for the challenge? Should I submit it? Submit it a day in advance or? Um, what's well, I the way it works is that the hour before the class starts, I come through the homework channel. I pull out pieces that I uh, have. Uh, feedback that I think is either useful or the praise that I'm hoping to heap on the person or, you know, to okay. create conversation topics that everyone can learn from. And so it's not like any people are winning or losing at this. It's really intended to be, mm -hmm. you know, a nice fun weekly thing where we all get together and we're working on a project each week. And, uh, you know, it gives okay. me an opportunity to like, you know, share what I know with the community. Cool. So at, at most one hour in advance, uh, um, just, uh, yeah, sometimes I see people posting like a minute beforehand. I'm watching them come in because oh. I'm in the chat like the minute beforehand. Okay, but yeah. yeah. Uh, Preferably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And how much time should we spend on it? Is any amount fine? Any amount's fine. We, this week I've seen anywhere from one hour to seven hours people putting in mm -hmm. on it. Um, sometimes people put it like we have some community members that have really exhaustive processes and they put a lot of hours in while other people are using it as a quick weekly mm -hmm. study, you know, a one hour warm up. Anything's fine. It's for you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for all your tips and this lesson. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. All right. We have one more question. I lied. <laughs> we had a lot of questions this week. Happy to oblige. Oh, hello. Um, first time here as well. Welcome. Um, so I am. Um, can we change, like, uh, expand the image or maybe, like, you know, add uh, the sides, maybe, I don't think so, just this? Uh, I, I think if you want to resize it a little bit, it should be okay. But um, don't just, you know, the spirit of it is really to focus on what's here in the frame and adapting it to, you know, mix, uh, you know, our observational skills and our imagination. 
All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone who asked questions. Thanks, everyone who did the assignment. I'll be back next week. The timing this week was crazy because of daylight savings. We all shifted an hour. I wonder if the event as it was listed was actually different than the time I went live today. Um, would not be surprised if that happened. We are going to make sure that these things are lined up next week. Uh, so keep an eye out. Thank you so much. And I will see you guys around. Be good. Okay. Bye-bye.